Ladies and gentlemen, dear comrades, Sani Bonane Nonke, Daragi Tavarish. First of all, I would like to express my gratitude to the organizers of this conference. First of all, Comrade Aziz Pahat, for this opportunity to share with you my reflections concerning International Criminal Court. I want to send thank you to Johannesburg University and its leadership for this great opportunity for me to speak on this topic in front of you. Today I would like to share with you my ideas and my understanding of what is this International Criminal Court, one of the most mysterious and probably one of the most dangerous institution in the modern international law. I would like to draw your attention to the screen. Uh, as you know, International Criminal Court was established in 1998. And to start my presentation, I would like to highlight several interesting, if I may put it this way, moments from the work of the ICC. The first case, Prosecutor versus Lubanga. This case was prepared almost seven years, but at the very first day of the trial, the very first prosecution witness confessed right in the courtroom that he gave a false testimony. Moreover, he confessed that this he was taught by the prosecution. Another case, prosecutor versus Kenyatta at Tallis, now only prosecutor versus Kenyatta. This trial was expected to commence last November, but suddenly prosecution filed an interesting motion seeking an adjournment of the provisional trial date. The prosecution explained it, that it doesn't have witnesses. Probably it's not surprising if you follow how the prosecution at ICC works, but it was even more surprisingly how the court reacted. Court did not dismiss the, the case, but said that trial commencement date vacated. Case prosecutor versus Laurent Gbagbo. The president of the Republic of Cote d'Ivoire <coughs> is in jail for more than two and uh, or let's say almost two and a half years without confirmation of charges. Let me draw your attention. I'm not talking about trial. This case is still on pretrial stage. So the man is imprisoned without co even confirmation of the charges. He is supposedly awaiting for trial too. The case prosecutor uh, versus Muammar Gaddafi. After the assassination, and uh, you all remember that it was public and demonstrative assassination of the accused of the court, the court simply terminates the proceedings. If we compare how other international courts work, you could see that sometimes witnesses who are refusing to answer to the questions of prosecution, they are immediately charged with the contempt of the court. Here we see that assassination of the accused of the court does not bring any contempt of the court. Prosecutor versus Jean-Pierre Bemba, the former Vice President of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. It's again unprecedented case where all the defense team is arrested, uh, with one exception. There is one, one non-African member of the team, he was not arrested. Uh, and uh, probably the final moment is the speech of President of Uganda, 
Mr. Museveni last September in General Assembly, where he said that ICC in a shallow, biased way has continued to mishandle complex African issues. This is not acceptable. The ICC should stop. I'm not uh, presenting Mus Mr. Museveni as uh, somebody who express the situation around ICC in the best way. I just would like to draw attention that he was the first uh, head of state to transfer the case to ICC voluntary, and now we see such a drastic change. So, uh, I think even non-lawyers will understand after this just several moments from the work of ICC that there is something wrong with this institution. And let me try to attempt to answer the question, what is ICC in reality? But to do this, let me just make a general overview of the cases which is at the ICC now. <coughs> we have eight situations. They are enumerated. It's Democratic Republic of the Congo, Uganda, Central African Republic, Sudan, Kenya, Libya, Cote d'Ivoire, and Mali. Each situation has several cases. Situations concerning the states, and uh, the cases concern the exact individuals. The situation in Democratic Republic of the Congo uh, uh, includes five cases. It's cases against Lubanga, Katanga and Chu in Taganda, Mudakumura in Barushemana. Uh, these are five cases. The first case is uh, finished on the trial level. Now it's on uh, the appeal. The second case is also finished. And another case is ongo ongoing. The case of Marushemana was dismissed. It was not confirmed on the pretrial level. The situation in Uganda has one case. It calls prosecutor versus Kony and Talis. This is a case against top members of the Lords of Resistance Army. Situation in Sudan contains five cases. It's a case against President al-Bashir. It's a case against Interior Minister Harun and Rahman. Case against Defense Minister Rahim Hussein. Uh, the case prosecutor versus Abu Garda uh, is finished because court declined to confirm charges brought by the prosecutor. And finally, the fifth case is the uh, case prosecutor versus Banda and Jerbo, uh, leaders of justice and equality movement. And uh, the trial will start very soon, in several weeks, but only against Mr. Banda. Mr. Jerba announced as a dead. Situation in Kenya, two cases. But let me draw your attention for, the, for these two cases. They are very interestingly developed. Initially, the prosecution brought two cases with three accused in each. The court did not confirm the charges against uh, each uh, against uh, one from each uh, case. So it reduced accused to two in every case. But what happened then? It's again unprecedented in the history of international criminal justice. Let me stress that after the court confirmed the charges against one of the accused, the prosecution withdraw its case. Prosecution withdraws the case against Mr. Mutaur. So it comes only for the prosecutor versus Kenya. The situation in Central African Republic, one case, prosecutor versus Jean Pierre Bemba. Situation in Libya con uh, contains three cases. The case against Muammar Gaddafi, the case against Saif Gaddafi, and the case against Mr. Senussi. The situation in Cote d'Ivoire, 
contains also three cases, prosecutor versus President Laurent Gbagbo, prosecutor versus Simone Gbagbo, who is the wife of President Laurent Gbagbo, and the very recent case, prosecutor versus Charles Blegoudé, the Minister of Sport and Youth Affairs, he appeared in court just several days ago. And the final situation is situation in Mali. No cases yet. Prosecution is still thinking about the case in within this situation. So that's a general overview of the cases. But I think it would be very difficult not to notice that all the cases in ICC is against Africa. Even the, if we, we uh, have a look at the investigations, ongoing investiga investigations, uh, which are not reach the level of cases or even situations, they are still against Africa. So the potential cases are against Nigeria or against Guinea. Here it is presented the short explanation of what kind of investigation the prosecution is conducting now. So, uh, I'm sorry to cite so much tonight, Mr. Museveni, but uh, I hope you remember very well his famous expression that what is ICC doing is hunting for Africans. Whether he's right uh, let's analyze this, and um, I will try to not to speak very specifically about uh, law, because I am aware that it is not only lawyers here in this conference room, but I still need to be uh, precise with certain legal moments to prove my point. So I will try to make it as easy as possible, but in the same time, uh, I need to be uh, legal tonight. So, uh, I enumerate four main problems of International Criminal Court that will help me to prove my final point, which I'm not, uh, which I don't tell you uh, for the moment. So, this is the problem of universality, the problem of situation referrals, fragmentation of international law, and deformation of international law. Let's start from the problem of universality. I'm sure that all of you listen almost every day that International Criminal Court is universally recognized. How the, this court is claimed about itself. Uh, whether it's true or not, let me present you map number one. Uh, this map uh, shows you the participation in the ICC statute of the uh, states. Uh, you see that the red color, uh, red colored states, these are the states are member parties to the IC ICC statute. The orange color represents states that signed ICC statute but not ratified yet and the gray uh, color represents states uh, who are not even signed the treaty. But uh, sometimes the simple things are more, uh, give us more clear picture than more complicated. So I would like to show you another map, map number two, which simply distinct countries between Members and not members, because these orange countries, they are not members, because non-ratification means they are not members. So when we look at this simple map, we could clearly see that ICC could not claim universality. The ICC could not claim that the norms included in the ICC statute universally 
recognized, including, for example, the norm that says that head of states do not have immunity anymore if they are facing international crimes. And many other norms, of course. So the second, uh, second problem is uh, situation referrals. You know that uh, up, to the no up to now we have two referrals. Uh, this is situation in Sudan in 2008 and in Libya in 2011. But let me draw your attention how these referrals are conducted. Article 13 of the ICC statute provides one of the way of exercising of jurisdiction of the ICC, and it is referral by the Security Council. So it's very interesting article, because this article, in fact, destroying the very basic fundamentals of international law. I posing one question. How could Security Council act outside the powers prescribed by the United Nations Charter? You see, the power of the Security Council prescribed not in the United Nations Charter, but in another treaty. But Security Council, of course, is the organ of international organization, and this organization works only according to the United Nations Charter. Let me uh, propose uh, the second problem for your reflection. Uh, this concerns exactly uh, the, the referrals of situations in Sudan and Libya. And uh, how it happened, it's ag ag again uh, unprecedented violation of international law. Let me tell you that is unprecedented violation of very basic ideas of international law as such. Look what happened. The state parties of a treaty force a non-state party to be obliged by this international treaty. This is absolutely against the essence idea of international law, which, based on the principle of voluntary participation of states and treaties. But what unworthy situation is the second question I pose here, because we know that Security Council constitute the exact states, and we have five permanent members of the Security Council. And if I put back this map, you will see that at least three members of the Security Council, this is United States of America, China and Russia, are not state parties to the ICC statute. And what happened? These known parties to the treaty Oblige another non parties to the treaty to be obliged of this treaty. This is against unprecedented. But if you look into the academic literature, it's there are not many lawyers who draw attention to that. Last year's we mostly draw attention to the analysis as the, the, the main method, scientific method of academic research. We are looking deep into the practice of certain organizations, but in my opinion it is not enough to understand what is ICC about if we do not use another very important scientific method of academic research is a synthesis. So let me use this method and show how 
I use it to prove my point. I would like to prove my point by putting the International Criminal Court into the context of the world system of international criminal justice. I enumerate the most important international tribunals existed uh, for the moment. And let us to see how these tribunals are acting and what is the role of ICC in this context. I hope we will come to interesting results using this method. I will analyze the activity of International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, for former Yugoslavia, Special Court for Sierra Leone, Special Court for Lebanon. And of course we come back to the ICC. Let me start from the question of legal way of the creation of the International Criminal Court. And I hope you noticed in what, uh, how I put this expression of legal way. Uh, we all know that uh, these two international tribunals, International Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia and for Rwanda, were created by the resolutions of the United Nations Security Council. But what is very interesting to notice is that both resolutions avoid to make a reference to a certain article of United Nations Treaty. Only what we have is reference to Chapter 7, but Chapter 7 is not of very good support because this reference made only with one intention to make this resolution obligatory to all states. But if we look into the Charter, we will realize that there is no article that Security <coughs> Council could rely on in establishing these tribunals. In fact, this is not my interpretation. If we look into travel preparatoire of these resolutions, we will be very much amazed that the very members of the Security Council even voted for that resolution, late explain, that they voted on the political reasons and uh, it is not legal. For example, the delegation of China said openly that it is not legal, but still voted in favor. But we, as, as, uh, as a lawyers, should <coughs> draw attention to this fact. This fact should not escape our attention. Uh, attention. Uh, what concerns the legal way of the creation of the International cr uh, Special Court for Sierra Leone, it also have a problems because the constitution of Sierra Leone does not prescribe any special courts. So this court uh, is it, its creation in a quite contradiction with the constitution of Sierra Leone. It's very interesting to see on the legal way of the creation of international uh, or special tribunal for Lebanon. And this is another very unprecedented attack to the international law. We all know how international treaty are agreed and how they enter into force. The state parties are signed treaty, but then it should be a ratification. And when both sides are ratified treaty, then it enters to force. What happened with this treaty on the establish establishment of uh, the Special Court for Lebanon? The government of Lebanon signed the treaty with the United Nations on, the, on this uh, special court, but the Lebanon parliament refused to ratify it. So according to the existing international law, that means the treaty will not enter into force. But the Security Council decided otherwise. It decided that this treaty will enter into force by its very resolution. I put this uh, citation from the speech of the Russian representative in the Security Council after the voting to this resolution. He said, the arrangement chosen by the, pro uh, the sponsors 
is dubious from the point of view of international law. I think it's not really dubious, it's probably just diplomatic language. The lawyers should say it quite straight. It's a direct violation of international law. It's unprecedented violation of international law. Unfortunately, Russia abstained from uh, voting to that resolution, and that resolution was finally adopted. And we have this tribunal. So let, let me uh, analyze <coughs> now the legal activity of international criminal courts. I would like to draw your attention to the very interesting activity of the Special Court for Sierra Leone. One of the most, or probably the most famous trial of this tribunal is the Charles Taylor trial. It's always a very interesting question, and who are the judges? Here are the three main judges, but that's not full bench of the judges. There was also the fourth judge. This is a judge, El Hadji Malik So from Senegal. What happened with this judge is quite an amazing story. I would like to draw attention to this and the following pictures. Here you see the judge in the bench, and here no judge. What happened with him? Probably you suspect that he's fallen sick or something. No, it happened something again unprecedented. Now I, I feel you have a feeling that it's only unprecedented things happened in ICC <laughs> or in our international criminal tribunals. <coughs> and that's quite true. Uh, this judge was removed, but the circumstances of his removal are quite amazing. I still could not excuse myself from what I did during the presentation of the judgment to Charles Taylor. Because for several years I recorded whole broadcast from the tribunal. And uh, why I decided not to record the pronoun pronoun pronouncement of judgment, I don't know. Probably I expect that nothing could happen because it was already too much things happened during the trial. Who could expect that something happened during just for reading of judgment? But it happened. I really wanted to show you what happened because it is really amazing. I, see, I, I saw that picture, but I could not find it anywhere. In YouTube, I searched it, I asked it a whole platoon of helpers. Nobody could help me. You could find everything on YouTube, but not what happened during the Charles Taylor trial. Let me explain what happened. The judges announced, Charles Taylor, you are guilty in all charges. And judges stand up, and suddenly we start to hear some words. It was not really clear what I and who is talking. And uh, uh, my first impression was, that is Charles Taylor trying to, to reply to the judges how good they are or something like that. But finally I realized that only three judges are stand up and leaving the courtroom. But the fourth judge is still sitting and that was he who, is, who was talking. What happened then? The tribunal staff switched off the sound and they started to put uh, blinds uh, for the public gallery. But at least we saw that one judge tried to say something and the tribunal prevent him, prevent us, prevent him to talk and prevent us to listen to him. But uh, this judge later explained what he was trying to say. Yes, and uh, he was removed for his behavior, but it was very important to understand what he was trying to say. He said in one of very interesting interview he gave to a uh, New African Journal, international justice cannot be based on rumors. These are mass crimes. We must have the highest standard of proof. 
We cannot have such a trial and base your decision on the questionable evidence that we have received in this trial. When the system is not functioning, we must say it. It is the duty of the judges to do so. If the judges don't say it, who will say it? So, uh, what this judge said in essence? He said even more terrible things. He said that the judgment against uh, Taylor was not discussed between judges. He never be allowed to take part in this discussion. Where this judgment came? I don't know, said Judge Malik so. I don't think I need to comment it and let me come to another part of activity of the international tribunals. I'm very much concerned about this because I'm working mostly for the defense of the accused and this is a very sensitive topic for me. How international tribunals are changing the already existing, existent human rights law. Let me give you an example from the activity of Special Court for Lebanon. <laughs> Only one question, trial in absentia. What international law says about that? The CCPR, which is Covenant for Civil and Political Rights, in Article 14 says that in determination of any criminal charges against accused, he shall in be entitled to the following minimum guarantees to be tried in his presence. What says the Special Court for Lebanon? Article 22 says, the Special Tribunal shall conduct trial proceedings in the absence of the accused. This is only one example how international tribunals are derogating the already uh, established and very well established body of human rights law, which is considered as non-derogatory norms. Uh, well, before, before, before I, I, I put uh, the, the, the next slide, I would like just to ask you <coughs> the special attention for that. This is extraordinary what we will see just in a second. I show you many slides. I, I really ask you to draw attention to that. This is a so extraordinary ca concept that it should be really distinguished. During the pronunciation of judgment, you see pronunciation of judgment uh, became very interesting moments. The judge said, accused, the fact that we are acquitting you does not mean that you are innocent. <laughs> I expect apl ap applause from you <laughs> to, to the judge. <laughs> but what is interesting, uh, the same judge several weeks ago pronounced the Nazi judgment. Uh, for the for the Mr. Katanga, uh, this Mr. Chu was acqu acquitted, but Mr. Katanga was convicted, and I really expect from the judge said, Mr. Katanga, the very fact that we are convicting you does not mean that you are guilty. <laughs> but unfortunately, the judge do not develop that concept, so uh, it's still probably for the next generation of judges. <laughs> Uh, let me come to my favorite international tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, and, uh, but because of time restraint, uh, I would like to draw your attention only to the concept of the so-called joint criminal enterprise. Uh, let me, let me uh, tell you first of all that um, uh, this concept is really concept in this tribunal. Uh, it is not prescribed in any law not in statute, not in rules of proceeding. It just was inserted by judges without any legal explanation. But of course there is explanation why they do it. But let me draw your attention to the following documents. The individual criminal responsibility uh, prescribed in the Article 7 of the statute. It says that a person who planned, instigated, ordered, committed or otherwise otherwise edit and debate it, and so on and so forth. You see, you see all the forms of uh, uh, responsibility is prescribed here in Article 7. But what's going on 
in the practice of ICTY. Let me draw attention to the indictment against General Radko Mladic. When we come to the indictment, we, 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 we can see that the prosecution is basing uh, responsibility of General Mladic on the concept of joint criminal enterprise. So the Article 7 is disregarded. Joint criminal enterprise. Why? It's very important to understand why. Because this concept of joint criminal enterprise allow judges to convict people, not those people who not only participate personally in the committing of these crimes, but also people who don't know about committing of these crimes. So you understand the difference. Article 7 makes prosecution to prove the real responsibility. The theory of joint criminal enterprise allowed to convict anybody. So, uh, what this analysis versus or probably plus synthesis, uh, how it helps us to understand what are the real reasons for the creating of international criminal system. Uh, I think that even all these tribunals don't have any hierarchy between each other. Even in practice, a very different and sometimes contradictory. There is still something that could connect the activity of all these tribunals. It is not really visible, but analysis plus synthesis help us to see this connecting line. This is a deformation of international law. But deformation is quite natural word, and I would like <coughs> to draw your attention to the um, <coughs> question what kind of deformation of it. I try to make this analysis and uh, you could see three main features of this deformation. First of all, it's destruction of the very nature of modern international law. Second, is a, it is a destruction of the existing norms of international law. And third, this is a creation of new norms. The examples are precise. To conclude, let me make a quick jump to the history of international law. What was international law before 1945? <coughs> this was still international law, but it was a law that considered war as a legal instrument for the settlement of disputes between states. This international law, except colonialism as a legal tool, <coughs> this international law, except division between civilized and other states, and only in 1990, uh, sorry, 1945, with the creation of the United Nations Charter, <coughs> the history of international law radically changed. This law started to be produced by all members of the international community. And it was made in the interest of all, or majority of the member states of the international community. That's why we call it inter uh, uh, modern international law. And I would like to say that it is important for us to call this law as a progressive international law. It was really progressive. What happened with international law in 1990s? Does international law is still progressive? To answer to this question, we need to see new trends in the development of modern international law. Whether international law is still developing by all members of international community? And what are the main features of this new developing? As we see now, 
the international law started to be produced by international courts. And even not by the courts, but for the exact judges. And this law is, of course, answering to the second question, is not answering to the interests of the whole international community. So this word deformation, I suggest to call probably more correct, more straight. It's a regressive or maybe even repressive international law. Because, for example, the derogation of the norm concerning the immunity of head of states, it's nothing else but the derogation of the principle of sovereignty of states. I try to enumerate the five main features of the regressive international law. This is an arbitrary way of its creation. It's parallel existence with the real international law. And I would like to stress specifically its fragmentation effect. Third, its derogative character. Fourth, it attempts to treat it like a real international law. And we see how international courts are citing each other, making an impression that this is a law and using so-called theory of judicial precedent. And finally, it's a creation of new norms and change of the existed norms. So what I should say in conclusion, my analysis bring me to the following conclusion. When we asking ourselves the question whether the International Criminal Court achieving the goals of reconciliation, peace and justice, we are forgetting the very fact that this court and generally the system of international criminal justice were not created to achieve these goals. That's why they never reach it. The real goal of the creation of the whole system is to produce a new law. And this goal is implemented very effectively. Yes, this law, this new regressive international law is still existing parallelly, in a parallel way with modern progressive international law. But every year, with each new and new decisions of international criminal tribunals, this new law became bigger and stronger. And one morning we could wake up and see that there is no, no progressive international law anymore. And we are facing only this new law. That's why I think it is very important for us, for lawyers and not only for lawyers, to put attention to these new trends and to resist for this destruction of progressive international law. I thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>